Before the break, Don Boudreau said that focusing on the minimum wage is the absolute worst way to help poor people. Now, as you might have guessed, Richard doesn't buy into that at all. So take a look at what he had to say about America's minimum wage debate. Well, I think for me, uh, I don't ask, even though I'm a professional economist and I've been that all my life, I don't ask about a minimum wage, first and foremost, what its effects will be on jobs. The reason I don't is I know what that debate is about. The only way conservative pro-business economists and publicists and politicians could challenge the raising of the minimum wage was by, was by coming up with something that might make a little bit of sense to push against it. So the argument was, if you raise the minimum wage, some employers somewhere who would have hired these people at the lower one won't hire them if you raise the minimum wage. My answer has always been, A, are there such employers? Sure, there must be a few. B, the question isn't only what happens to those at the margin. We know in economics that many workers who get paid more than the minimum wage get more because their employer knows to get his workers, he has to pay 5%, 10%, 20% more than the minimum. So if you raise the minimum wage, you're actually raising the wages of a whole ladder of workers in the society. And now comes what really concerns me. Either we make an economy that serves the mass of people who are wage earners by giving them a decent standard of living so they can raise their families and feel good about themselves, or we don't. If we don't, we have to face that in order to make capitalism work and profits accrue, we have to do to the mass of people something no decent people would ever do to each other. So when I hear the argument, let's keep the minimum wage lower, I understand I'm talking to people who are willing to support an economic system whose success depends on depriving the mass of people of a decent income. For me, that is a fundamental criticism of capitalism, even though it's put forward unknowingly by people who love capitalism. That's interesting. Now, uh, let, let, me, uh, let me tease this out a little bit uh, through globalization because, you know, we're going to be talking, therefore, about the difference between uh, the standards of living in one group and another. Uh, when you think about globalization, the gains from trade are supposed to be about the consumption from the lower cost imports, while the loss is supposed to be the foregone consumption from manufacturing goods that, and deploying services for export for someone else. But now somehow people are acting like it's the reverse. Look, I mean, look at Germany as an example. They're suppressing wages. They're actually suppressing wages in order to increase export competitiveness so that they can uh, you know, manufacture stuff for other people rather than consuming those goods themselves. How, my, my overall question is, how is globalization working for consumers? Well, let me, let me respond on the question of Germany because I think you're quite right that it makes a very important comparison. And we can touch a number of issues. First, the uh, minimum wage in Germany, just to, by comparison, is over $11 an hour compared to our $7.25. In other words, Germany pays as its minimum wage more than 50% higher than we do in the United States. And over the last six years of crisis, while our economy has been in deep trouble, the German economy has been improving, and not just for the bottom line of the corporations, but for the mass of people. Number two, you're right that Germany keeps the wages from rising. But the reason the German working class highly organized uh, in trade unions, much more than the United States, and with two political parties, the Socialist Party and something called the Left Party, the Die Linke Party, with two parties representing their interests, they got a deal. You can keep our wages down, but you cannot let the prices go up. If you let the prices go up, we will demand higher wages. So while they keep the wages down, they've also kept their prices down. That's why a restaurant meal in Berlin costs half or a third of what the same meal costs in Paris or London or Rome. So they've got a system there in which workers and capitalists are forced to come to a real deal with one another because they haven't allowed corporatism, your earlier point, to kind of take over. Last thing. The proof of the pudding is in the eating. If free trade, or the kind of trade we have now, usually called free trade, although it's a question whether it really is, but if the, if the trade we have has produced 
a good result, then you'd have to take your hat off and say, well, maybe that's a good system. But in point of fact, it hasn't. The reality is that there are more people poor today in every one of the countries engaging in uh, free trade, more people poor relative to the rich in their society, or to say thing, the same thing another way, that the gap between rich and poor has gotten much worse in the last 25 years in this country, and much worse, for example, in China, and much worse in virtually every European country. For the mass of people, that's what counts. Free trade, globalization has not delivered anything like the utopian images of being better off that were promised to us. What value is, does, uh, is Marxism to us as an economic framework in thinking about the economy? Well, you know, it's hard to talk about this, and it's hard to do it in a quick amount of time, and I know the time is limited. Uh, but let me try. Uh, we have been afraid to talk about Marx, Marxism, and in general criticisms of capitalism for 50 years. The Cold War made it impossible. If you tried to raise Marx's criticisms of capitalism, you were thought to be somehow disloyal or uh, untrustworthy or kooky or something like that. And you basically made it too dangerous so that students didn't study it, teachers didn't teach it, the media didn't discuss it, and politicians pretended it wasn't there. We're slowly coming out of that. We're maturing. We're realizing that the Cold War is now 20 odd years behind us. So maybe we can face what it is. You want to understand capitalism? You can talk to and listen to the economists who think it's the best thing since sliced bread. But you also ought to listen to the Marxists, those who have developed over 150 years a very sophisticated set of criticisms. Then you make up your own mind. But it is ignorant and self-defeating to listen only to one and to push the other one out of the conversation because you find it difficult to contend with those criticisms. Marxism is the most developed set of criticisms of capitalism. And a healthy society would be wanting to hear those criticisms, see what's reasonable in them and what can be learned from them rather than treating them like a taboo that it's too scary to entertain.